What if you could take heat and turn it straight into electricity? More than 90% of the world's electricity comes from sources of heat such as coal, natural gas, nuclear energy, and concentrated solar. And almost all of that heat then heats water to drive turbines to create electricity. The history of humanity has been finding increasingly complicated ways to boil water. And there's a problem with that. On average, steam turbines reliably convert only about 35% of a heat source into electricity. And that machinery depends on moving parts that are temperature limited and heat sources higher than 2000 degrees C are simply too hot for turbines. But is there a different way? A device with no moving parts that passively captures heat from a white hot source and produces electricity? Engineers at MIT and the National Renewable Energy Laboratory think so. And rather than designing a different type of turbine, they are developing a fundamentally different way of turning heat into electricity, a solar panel for heat. These are called thermophotovoltaic cells. They convert heat directly into electricity, just like normal solar panels convert light into electricity. Heat in this definition is just infrared radiation, the light that warm objects emit and why we can use thermal cameras to detect people. The photons in this part of the spectrum are much lower in energy than visible light, so solar panels, partly due to their materials constraints, typically haven't focused on how to capture them. The color of the light emitted by a warm body follows a black body radiation distribution that depends on its temperature. As the object gets hotter, the peak of that emission moves to higher energy photons. So red hot is colder than white hot, which is colder than blue hot. Two questions for you. Let me know your answers in the comment section down below. One, why isn't this green hot rather than white hot? And two, if the hottest part of a flame is the top, which it is, look, you can put a match in a Bunsen burner and it won't light. Why is the bottom of this flame blue? The MIT team's design has been shown to generate electricity from a heat source of between 1900 degrees to 2400 degrees Celsius, about 4300 degrees Fahrenheit for those Americans out there. To produce the thermophotovoltaic, the cell is fabricated from three main regions, a high band gap alloy, which sits over a slightly lower band gap alloy, and underneath is a mirror-like layer of gold. The first layer captures the highest energy photons from the heat source and converts them into electricity. Lower energy photons that pass through that first layer are then converted into electricity in the second layer, and any photons that pass through the second layer and aren't captured are reflected by the gold mirror-like surface below back to the heat source rather than being absorbed as wasted heat. This isn't a step that normal solar panels do because returning photons back to the sun isn't usually the goal, but reflecting them back to a hot surface that is driving the process is really important. That small amount of heat can later be re-emitted from the bulk, hopefully as a higher energy photon that can be captured. And it has achieved an efficiency of 40%. 5% higher than traditional steam turbines. But more importantly, this also removes the need for a steam turbine infrastructure, which usually represents roughly 20 to 40% of the total direct cost of something like a new nuclear power plant. According to the MIT team, to date, most thermophotovoltaic cells have only reached efficiencies of around 20%, with the highest ever recorded up until now at 32%. This is largely because they are designed to operate at lower temperatures, which ultimately compromise their efficiency. But other than creating electricity right at the source of where we are producing heat, it might also have other applications energy storage in heat form to make something like the viral sand battery that we saw last year actually viable. I want to talk about that, but first I have to thank today's sponsor, Anchor Solix, a dedicated sub-brand of Anchor, the world's number one mobile charging brand who are launching the Anchor Solix F3800, a power bank not just for the home, but a portable powerhouse. With its suitcase-like design, retractable handle, and large wheels, it's ready to light up any adventure. At home, during a power outage, the F3800's massive 3.84 kilowatt hour internal battery that can be expanded up to 53.8 kilowatt hours will ensure that you are never left in the dark. It's rechargeable both with a 2400 watt solar power capability or through a conventional 1800 watt AC outlet. Whether it's your washing machine, refrigerator, or multiple appliances at once, the F3800 is up to the task with its 6000 watt, 120 volt, or 240 volt dual voltage output. If you take the F3800 on the road with you, you can enjoy off-grid power when you need it, even capable of plugging directly into and charging your electric vehicle. Click on the link down below and don't miss the chance to enjoy a 35% limited early bird discount. Thank you, Anchor Solix, for supporting the channel. And now, back to the video. 
The sand battery that went viral back in 2020 is designed to hold heat rather than electrical charge and sparked imagination because it hinted at finally a cheap way to store energy. Using various sources like solar, wind, or even off-peak grid electricity, the sand battery stores excess heat by heating up sand to about 600 degrees Celsius, which is about 1000 degrees Fahrenheit, usually via electrical heaters or thermal collectors, which have the benefit of being very efficient. This heat is retained for extended periods of time in containers or facilities that are well insulated and can be extracted by passing air or a fluid through the heated sand, which then becomes heated itself and can be used directly for heating purposes in space heating or water heating. Sand is obviously very abundant and quite a cheap material. Using it as a thermal storage medium can be a simple and potentially more cost-effective approach than other methods. The energy density is obviously nowhere near something like lithium ion batteries but here that isn't the goal. Now in my mind this was always a story that was a bit of an overhype. These thermal energy systems have been around for a long time. We've seen them in concentrated solar power that use things like molten salts to store energy from the sun. It was actually a BBC interviewer that coined the setup as a sand battery that suddenly made it seem new and differentiated and caught the internet's attention. It's great if you just want to warm air or water, that's one thing, but likely for a single home use or even a couple of homes, this is overkill, something that equates to warming your hands with a blowtorch. That amount of heat would be hard, if not impossible, even for a household running an oven 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to use that amount of heat. Unless obviously you built it into a communal heating infrastructure, which is absolutely not a bad idea, but it does require some pre-planning on the part of a city or a home construction company or some level of retrofitting to construct and bury the steel pipework and infrastructure that is needed to connect everything up. Quickly, the cheapness and the scalability kind of starts to go out the window. It's also only good if you don't want electricity out of it. If you do want electricity out of it, the value proposition of using something cheap like sand kind of goes out the window because then you need to buy a steam turbine and associated infrastructure, which are reasonably expensive and also expensive to run. However, by adding something like thermophotovoltaics into a sand battery-like application, something really interesting happens. Whether it's for home communal industrial storage, that infrastructure requirement drops significantly. If it's only electricity that's needed, these sites wouldn't even need to be local to where they supply power, moving them more into the range of things like liquid flow battery facilities that are popping up at the moment around China. These are massive redox tanks that store chemical energy in the form of liquid electrolytes, which can then be converted back to electricity by passing the fluid through a special membrane. The problem obviously with electrolyte solutions is that they will always be more expensive, particularly compared to something like sand, and their lifetime actually isn't that great, typically quoted as around 15 years, whereas sand tends to last for quite a while. Here obviously the efficiency of converting chemical energy to electrical energy will always be higher than converting heat to electricity. Lithium ion batteries I think are about 95 plus percent efficient. Redox flow batteries I think are about 85 percent plus efficient, so it kind of knocks it out the water. But really if the proposition is producing cheap, scalable energy storage, maybe there is a gap in the market where these devices do actually find a unique foothold. The cell experiments by the MIT team were on devices of about one square centimeter. For a grid scale thermal battery system, the research team envisaged that the cells would have to be scaled up to about 10,000 square feet, which is about a quarter of a football field, that was clearly information written by an American, and would operate in climate controlled warehouses to draw power from banks of stored solar energy, potentially from things like thermal sand batteries. And we are quite good at producing photovoltaics already. The infrastructure exists for making large scale cells and could quickly, in theory, be adapted to produce thermo photovoltaics. In fact, this is already happening across a few startups. And Tora Energy Inc., a startup with investors including billionaire Bill Gates's Breakthrough Energy Ventures, preserves energy as heat within graphite blocks at temperatures higher than 1800 degrees Celsius. This energy is released using current generation thermophotovoltaic, so potentially less efficient than is ideal, but can also be directly converted into heat and may be transformative in industries like cement making or steel manufacturing, which necessitate high heat and conventionally depend on fossil fuels such as natural gas and coal. But obviously these sites also need electrical storage. To put some of the numbers in perspective, Antora are targeting a cost point of $5 to $10 per kilowatt hour, while similar lithium ion battery solutions cost around $400 to $500 per kilowatt hour. This could mean reducing the cost of energy storage by up to 100x. 
But all that to say, there are still significant challenges left to overcome in some of the practicalities of actually implementing these systems, which I don't think gets talked about enough when this topic is brought up. Part of why thermophotovoltaic systems like Antora and the MIT team both operate at 1800 degrees Celsius plus is because that's where thermophotovoltaics become increasingly efficient, as the energy of the photons emitted from the heat source is higher and easier to capture against engineerable band gaps. This, however, comes with a significant engineering challenge associated with it. I'm sure everyone from the internet right now was shouting steel beams melt at 1300 degrees Celsius. You probably wouldn't be using steel beams in construction of these units, but regardless, high temperature engineering, particularly if there is going to be thermal cycling, the system getting hotter and colder, which there has to be in order to receive or deliver heat, causes huge material stresses over time. Worst case scenario, this is breaking down and opening up the walls of the unit that you've made, but also it makes normally simple things like designing a circuit board and the electronics that go in it that can operate these environments suddenly a huge challenge. A trend that I'm seeing in the marketplace at the moment through some of the ventures that are coming through our doors to try and raise investment are aiming to move into lower temperature regimes with thermophotovoltaics, but I don't think that that 40% energy efficiency level demonstrated by the MIT team will be seen in low temperature ranges for a while, potentially forever. So it will be a trade-off of accepting lower energy efficiency for potentially a cheaper, easier infrastructure build-out and more reliable unit. The pursuit of harnessing heat more efficiently through these technologies represents a pivotal shift in how we think about energy storage and use. Thermophotovoltaic cells are potentially a revolutionary concept in direct heat to electricity conversion. Still, the evolution of such technologies highlights our relentless quest for smarter, cleaner, and more efficient energy solutions. As we move forward, striking a balance between high efficiency and durable infrastructure will be a key challenge left to overcome. Hey guys, thanks very much for making it all the way to the end. If you enjoyed this video, feel free to give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you aren't otherwise subscribed to the channel. Thank you, as always, for watching. I will see you guys next time. Goodbye.